So when we talk about premise two, and your friend says, oh, really? Right? Just like they do to me on my own Christian website. Ed, you know, you're not smart enough for this. Let me just cut and paste, or let me just pull down. This is what I hate. I always tell people don't do this to me. They'll send me a 40-page article off the web and say, it's all right here. And I'm like, why don't you read it? You know, I'm not interested in reading this. I want to, I want to know what you think. Just tell me. No, 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 Ed, it's in this article. It's like, okay, so you don't know what you're talking about. Because if you did, you could explain it. All right, so let's take a look at this for a minute when we talk about design here. All right, remember what I said, inductive arguments never prove a claim. Inductive arguments give you evidence so you can determine is it reasonable, okay? So there's eight facts. These are only eight. I got about 50. So I, I'm narrowing them down to ones just for this class that everybody agrees on. This is not a Christian thing. And these eight facts alone make a strong case for a designed, created universe. The first one is literally chemical properties that are in material objects that are living, even non-living, <laughs> can't exist without those properties the way they are. Life depends on these properties that are at the, the atomic structure of the nucleus. Right? So that by itself is designed on a razor's edge. It's very specific. And these chains of molecules that are formed are very specific. There's no randomness about them. When you're talking about iron or you're talking about carbon or you're talking about oxygen, there's only a certain way they can be. And if we talk about an unguided process, how come they never vary? How come they're always exactly the same all the time? I thought we were talking about I gave you rock piles that can vary all over the place. It's kind of interesting. These never move. They always stay the same. The electron orbit around the nucleus, always the same. The next one is there's only four forces in the universe. That's it. There's only four. These four forces have an equation on how they operate, and they operate within very specific bands. There are no other forces that exist. And if they didn't behave the way they did, life couldn't exist. How on earth? Why is there only four, and why do they operate so precisely by an equation? You can't even do that with your checkbook. <laughs> you can't even, if you could figure out the stock market with an equation, you wouldn't be in this class. You'd be in the Bahamas on your own island, right? <laughs> and yet the universe operates very precisely. You can take one piece of paper and write all the equations that define the universe on one side. That's how elegant the universe is. You just got to wrap your mind around this. When you ever, like Christmas season this year, when everybody was getting all their ornaments hung in the tree up and everything, was anybody frustrated in going through the process of getting that all set up? Right? You weren't, why not? Say it louder. Well, loving it doesn't make it easy. What, do you ha what did you have to do to make it operate so smoothly without any issues? Or did you have issues? Were you short some bulbs or missing hang hangers? Or did you, were you like clockwork? I'm going to do it Tuesday. It will take me an hour and a half, and I'll be done with the tree, and then I'm going to move on this day, and I'm going to do it that day, and it just operated really well. Huh? So what happens with most of us, she's an anomaly, is there's always something missing. There's a broken bulb. Like I, I went through it with my lights this year. A string, don't those drive you nuts? There's one out, you're supposed to find it, right? Our tree, after four years, I had to go get a new artificial tree, it didn't work. Something always happens, right? So if I could write an equation or have a pattern where I told, you told your husband, uh, hey, Andrew, it's going to take me 6.2 hours this year to do our, all of our Christmas setup and everything, plus or minus two minutes, because I have it down pat and I know there's no problems. Right? <laughs> guys, guys, that's the universe. This is how the universe operates. You've got to make sure you understand what I'm trying to say here. Literally, 
the way the moon pulls on gravity to the Earth is very precise, so we have tides operating it the same way. And that's just not the moon's gravitational attraction of the Earth. That's everywhere in the universe. It's operating precisely at specific times and places all the time. You, you can go out and say, I wonder if Orion's belt will be there. It's always there. Do you ever wonder about this? We can't even do our Christmas setup precisely. And we have a universe around us that always operates the same. Then you've got this whole idea of fine tuning we're going to get into next week, where there's at least 50 different variables. That's why when um, I think Austin raised his hand about oxygen, and I said necessary but not sufficient, there's a, there's a differential equation in mathematics you write that has at least 50 variables, and all 50 have to be exactly right and operating within a precise tolerance range or life can't exist. How the heck does that happen? We are exactly in the right place. The Milky Way galaxy is exactly the right galaxy in the right place in the universe, so there couldn't be life. Inside the Milky Way galaxy is something called the solar system. Why is it called solar system? We only have one solar. This is completely unique. Stars usually aren't alone. We happen to have a solar system with one star. It just happens to be the right size, mass, and luminosity. If it was off at all, life couldn't exist. And it's inside the Milky Way, just in the right place. <laughs> and then you talk about the speck on Earth. These are, these are a lot of fun to look at. Um, you ever wonder what makes water so cool? It's the only liquid that when it freezes, it's less dense, so it floats. It's, it's less dense as a solid than as a liquid. I don't know. What does it mean when I say, why is that important that water, not just fish, everything. everything. Literally, all your lakes ponds, rivers, everything would freeze from the bottom up if it was denser as a solid. And not only does it float, but it has properties of thermal protection as well, where because of the way it reflects as a denser um, ice, it prevents um, too, getting too hot, it gives you a thermal layer there so that the water temperatures decrease. As you go down from the surface, it's warmer at the top, and then it decreases down. It's layered, so it's not altogether one temperature. And that doesn't even matter. Like right now, I sweat. I'm sweating when I'm talking. Why is that important? It's water's latent heat properties. You know what would happen if we didn't sweat? We'd blow up. <laughs> We'd blow up. <laughs> Water, we're going to do a whole, one time we get a chance, we're going to do a video on water. You're not going to believe what water's like. Uh, it's 39.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Why do, you, why do I care about that? What, what are we going to do with that? No, I'm just teasing you. It's just interesting when you think about something you drink every day and the way it operates, just the properties of water tell you there's a designer. And we're just talking about water. On here, I also talk about the tilt of the earth. We're going to talk about that in fine tuning. It's 23.5 degrees plus or minus 1.2 degrees. But that's 1.2 degrees is the distance from the center of the Earth to the center of the sun. So that 1.2 degrees, when you draw the, the angle, you can't even measure it. It's so finely tuned. Why is it important that the tilt of the Earth as it rotates is held so tightly? You couldn't have seasons. They wouldn't exist. <laughs> It would always be one temperature all the time as it goes around. So half the Earth would be frozen. The other half of the Earth would be hot. But because it's so perfect when it rotates at that angle, we have four seasons. It just goes on and on. Why is the gravitational pull of our, of our moon, our moon's really interesting. It's a young, fairly young moon at just the right spot for gravity. Why is the gravitational pull between the moon and the Earth so important? Why are the tides important? Yeah, think, think, uh, the example I always give is in your driveway, if you have a pothole and it rains hard and it fills with water, 
and it's summertime and it's 100 degrees or it's hot out, what happens to the puddle of water if it doesn't evaporate? It's pretty gross, right? Maybe mosquitoes and all algae and everything because it's not turning over. Literally, the moon is responsible for the bottom of the ocean by gravity being turned up to the top and coming down again. So everything's constantly in motion. So you have nutrients always being turned so it stays perfect for life. And these, I'm just talking about three or four out of 50. And then the generator we call the hydrologic cycle. It contains 99.2% 99 of the water, so we hardly lose any water from it. And this is what it meant in Ecclesiastes when, when he says, it's kind of interesting how all the water falls down to the rivers, the rivers run into the sea, but the sea never dries up, and then the water goes back to where it returned. He just described the hydrologic cycle. It rains, by gravity it goes into the sea, evaporation back to the clouds, back to the, back to the rivers, it's just a cycle. Without it, life wouldn't exist. So I just talk about these, and I say there's plenty more we can talk about. This is insane.